Hello and welcome back to the channel. A friend of mine recently started using FL Studio and they had a really good question. They see lots of professional producers using MIDI clips and patterns, but they also see others who almost exclusively use audio clips on the playlist, and they were wondering which sounds better, and also what are the differences in the workflow. So this really is a video for people that are fresh to FL Studio, new to the program, and if you're a much more advanced user, please feel free to dive through my sound design playlist, the mixing and mastering videos on this channel. There's a lot more to enjoy. But for those of you that want to know more about the different workflows in FL Studio, Let's dive right in and take a listen. I've got a lot of different pros and cons and points to get around to in this video as quick as I can. I've put them on the description as well. Uh, firstly, I have a pattern or a loop made here. One is using only MIDI and instruments and it's all patterns here. The other is only audio clips. Take a listen, they should sound pretty much the same. So for some genres, you can basically achieve the same result, but there's so much more to it. This is just a quick example to show that one doesn't necessarily sound better or worse than the other. First point that's really important is CPU and RAM. So if you're only running off audio clips, you're not forcing your CPU to run through plugins. I know this is really sort of basic stuff for some people, but it's going to save you a lot of CPU. So if I press play and look at the meter up here, It was probably averaging about 9, maybe 10, that's with my screen recorder running as well. Whereas if I go to the MIDI clips, all of a sudden there's going to be a big surge on the CPU. It stabilized somewhere between 40 and 45 uh, percent of my CPU being used there. So clearly if you're on an underpowered machine, which is what most of us do when we start out, I started on a really rubbish laptop, uh, it's probably better to print a few of your audio files, especially things that are running, you know, through synthesizers like Serum, using, you know, multi-voice synthesizers that use a lot of CPU. So that's a really quick point. The next point I want to address is that often people find that if they arrange their drums in the playlist, they sound a lot louder and a lot more punchy. And this is technically based in fact, but I'm going to explain why drums are louder when you put them on the playlist and you can get them just as loud in the channel rack. So firstly, press F6 to pull open the channel rack. That's a good shortcut there. I've got a snare here in my browser. Left click and drag onto my channel rack. There we go. I'm gonna press F4 to create a new pattern. I'm just gonna name that snare, perfect. And I'm just gonna fill in a couple of steps just as you do. I'm gonna add this over to the playlist. If I take the exact same snare sample and I drag it onto the playlist, if I add it on here, you'll hear that this is dramatically louder than the one in the channel rack. Same sound, a lot louder, feels a lot more punchy as a result. So many people believe that just arranging the drums in the playlist is just going to give you a much punchy, you know, bigger sound on the drums, which could be true if you don't want to adjust any volumes. However, the reason for this is quite simple. If you open up the channel rack by pressing F6 again, if you go and select the snare, which is a left click just here, and open up the graph editor at the top right hand here, you'll see that you get access to a lot of different controls, note, velocity, release, shift, all this stuff. The velocity is what's important. If I select the velocity, you can see that they're not maximum. So if I were to increase the velocity all the way to maximum, or adjust the channel gain here, you'll hear that they actually can sound just as loud. And it's also worth noting, just for beginners, the velocity here, if I right click and open the piano roll, it matches the velocity at the bottom of the piano roll here. So if I were to reduce this like this, you'll see that it also mimics it in the graph editor here. So they're one and the same thing. This means that if you are arranging beats in the channel rack, just be wary of that difference in volume if you're dragging the same sample into the playlist in the channel racks. Not really anything to worry about, but there you go. The next point I want to talk about is getting your track in the right key. So I've created this little beat here, which I think sounds great, but say I get a vocalist involved and that's way out of their register and you need to change the key of the song. It's quite easy using MIDI and it sounds great, but it can sound really bad on a printed audio clip. 
So you've got to weigh up the pros and cons of this. I'm going to show you what I mean here. So if I select the bass, you can double click to pull open the piano roll or press F7. It's going to pull open the bass line. So there's a good shortcut for you here. Control A selects everything. And then if you hold down the shift key and the up or down arrow keys, you can change everything one semitone at a time. So I'm going to push it five semitones down. So our first note is on a C sharp. So that's the register they're going to sing in. Now, if I were to do the same for the chords, so control A, shift, one, two, three, four, five, I can quickly change the key of everything. And because of the way that the synthesizer responds to the MIDI, each of these bass notes is going to be really nice and crisp, and each of these chords is going to be very beautifully voiced because it's generating a brand new sound each time. So it's going to sound a little bit off because the key has changed, but it'll still sound nice and crisp and punchy. So it sounds different, but you'll get used to it in a minute. Whereas if I want to change the key of this here, I can't arrange the notes any differently. So I have to just select the whole thing together, go to the pitch range at the top, one, two, three, four, five semitones, and then pitch it down like this. I have to do the same thing to the keys here at the top. And now you'll hear what it sounds like. And I want to hone in on the bass to show you the big differences in the sound here. So let's listen to the MIDI. The audio. It's lost all of its distinction. A little bit higher up. just sounds mushy and weird. This lo-fi effect of pitch shifting can actually sound great on some things. Sometimes on electric guitar, it can sound really funky and cool. So if you want to repitch stuff and you're not sure what key your song is in, you're probably just going to have to stick with MIDI for now. It'll make life a lot easier later on. The next point is all to do with inspiration and how you make your beats. If you come from a background of rich music theory and maybe playing keys or piano, Arranging synths and bass lines like this is not a challenge. However, for the vast majority of us who first open up a DAW, we are not experts in music theory, and we like using loops, chord loops, bass loops, drum loops, just to give us some kind of inspiration, a starting point when we're learning, because we're trying to handle this whole new DAW and music theory and everything. We just need a little bit of a, a helping hand. For instance, I'm just going to search for a different bass loop, uh, to start an idea with. I have this pack here which is full of bass loops, so it's just a random one I have. Right, let's, let's just go with that one and make it work. So if I initially drag it in, it's far too long, so this won't work at all. Sounds great. Right, so the quick way to do this, I have a whole video showing how to retime any loop, but basically double click, change the mode to stretch, and then in the time section, right click and select the number of beats or bars it's supposed to be. Now in this case, it's four bars, but if you were to select the wrong one, it would be very obvious because it would be far too quick like this. Okay, so four bars. We've got a totally different rhythm going on right now. To be honest, I'm not the biggest fan of the sound of the synth, so I can just use the same notes. on a keyboard uh, and a synth sound that I actually like. If you're absolutely brand new and you don't know how to get the notes out of this, there's no shame in that when you're starting out. Double click it, right click in here, edit in pitch corrector. It basically just gives you the notes here. With it expanded, we can see uh, we're starting on C sharp, going up to an E, going up to an F sharp, etc. And you can just mimic the notes and the timing on your own keyboard. It can be a good way to learn these sorts of things if you're not used to it. Once you know what bass line works, you should be able to just jumble up those notes to find a really nice melody or an arpeggio that sounds great to you. And it means that you've used that bass loop, dropped it into the playlist, and in your final song you might not even use it uh, because you've come up with this fantastic idea that's a lot more unique and creative to you. It sounds like you. Another reason why I love dragging audio clips into the playlist is because when I feel like my production's maybe getting a little bit boring, like these drums here, I find really good inspiring drum loops. I've got some from Decap here. He's an incredible, incredible beat maker. 
So if I just drag that into my playlist, again, I'll do the retiming, uh, and I just take a listen to this, I'll have to turn it down because it really slams. What I can do as a beginner is zoom in on this, and there's a good shortcut for zooming in. If you hold control and scroll with your mouse, it zooms in like this, and if you hold alt and scroll in, it zooms like this, so you can get really close to the playlist. You can see where all the kicks, hi-hats, and snares are, you can see that they're not all on the grid, and you can now manually line up your samples with this and mimic the drum patterns, and in doing that, you're learning music theory, you're learning rhythm and timing. Of course, it goes without saying, this doesn't mean you just rip off other people's beats, but it is a really good way to learn. It's a bit like making a cover song or a remix. You're getting to learn how to use your DAW and all the skills without having to come up with all the chords, melodies, and drums yourself. The next point I want to talk about is that the channel rack doesn't deal with transients and groove very well. With very simple samples, you can just press uh, play here, and it sounds great. However, I have a snap sample here, like a click, and if I just put that in the same place as the snare and mute the snare, you'll hear that this doesn't sound good at all. The click is behind time, it's like someone's clicking too late each time, and this is because of the transient of the sample. So a transient is a change in signal, so when a signal goes from nothing, spikes up, and then sometimes falls back down again. On a snare you can see that it goes from nothing and immediately jumps up, but on this snap sample there's loads of layered samples. So where exactly is the start of this sample? I can adjust the sample start like this, but it's just going to make it sound really weird because I, I, I'm cutting off the start essentially. So it is in time, but I'm missing all this texture at the start. So what do we do? The best thing to do is to just drag it onto the playlist and do it yourself. I'm just going to simply drag the click from here straight into the playlist and now I can manually line it up to where the snare would have been. So let's just do something like this and see how that sounds. So a little bit early. There we go, that's perfect. And now if I line up the second one as well. So it feels a little bit lazy, it's a little bit grooved but I can make it fit exactly the way I want to. A really easy way to copy these across is to select at the top by pressing Control left click, selecting this whole area, and then by pressing Control and just selecting these two snaps. Now if you just press Control B, it pastes it across in the exact same position just two bars later. And I can just keep doing that. If you were simply to select them and press Control C and Control V, you're then going to have to manually line them up again, and it just takes a lot more time than just selecting them like this, Control B, paste them all the way across. So the biggest point I'm trying to stress between the channel rack and the playlist is that just because the channel rack says that something is lined up, it doesn't mean it's actually lined up. There are a couple of tools that help you. Again, in the graph editor, you can go to this shift parameter that helps push samples around a little bit. So these hi-hats here, for instance, if I push the shift value here, it's now actually halfway between this step and that step. See the difference there? So uh, this one again. I'm going to shift a lot. So just a little bit of shift can make the thing sort of groove a little bit better. But to be honest, I find that it's really fiddly, and even if you shift them and then you close it, you can't see that you've shifted it until you reopen it again. Whereas on the playlist, everything is visible. And this takes me on to my next point, which is that sometimes people just like to see everything in their project. And I'm sometimes like this. If it's on the playlist, it's all there in front of you. You can't miss any of it. Whereas if it's on here, things are hidden. They're hidden inside instruments, inside patterns, and it just might not be ideal for your workflow. An analogy for this is that some people like being in a studio where there's instruments and keyboards and everything is plugged in and ready to go all the time, whereas other people like storing things away and then they just like taking out the device they need as and when they need it. Neither is right or wrong, better or worse, it's just different people and different workflows. The final place where the playlist really excels compared to the channel rack is basically just on any long sample, so things like crashes, uh, fallers, risers. So if I just pull a crash in here, and I press play, you could do that in a pattern, but it's not going to be as easy. The next step makes things even more obvious. If I uh, duplicate that one there, 
and I'm just going to zoom in. If you select this little wave file icon here in the corner and you uh, left click, make unique. Now I can affect this one without changing this. Double click, I'm going to reverse that and I can just make turn that faller or crash into a riser. And timing these risers and fallers properly in the channel rack, virtually impossible, which is why you'll see people do a combination. The last thing I want to say is that when it comes to exporting your track and things like loudness, sound quality, there will be no difference whether you're using a kick that's being triggered from the channel rack or from the playlist. It doesn't make a difference the way FL Studio processes the audio. As long as you're sending everything to mixer tracks, mixing it the way you want, there's no, uh, there should be no worry about one sounding better and one sounding worse. So hopefully this video has been helpful, showing you a lot of workflow tips and tricks. And uh, if you want to learn more, there are tons more videos, shorter and longer, all over my channel with lots of information in them. So thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. And I hope to see you in the next video too. Bye for now.